Welcome to Across Africa, France 24's weekly roundup from across the continent. Coming up this week, Ivorians in the seaside resort of Grand Bassam are still shaken by the memory of last month's bloodshed. It became the site of the country's first ever terror attack, and the tourists upon which locals rely have remained away. Also, as Malawi and Mozambique raise the alarm about the impact water shortages are having on food security, Zambia and Zimbabwe see their power supplies threatened by ongoing regional drought. And a South African head teacher sues the government for turning its back on his school, though the institution's attended by thousands of students, it's operating out of only a few classrooms. Well, this week saw the one-month anniversary since Ivory Coast's first ever terror attack. The little town of Grand Bissam has since tried to get back on its feet, but it's tough going. It's long relied on the local and overseas visitors who come in and spend money whilst enjoying its picturesque beaches. But after 19 people were shot dead on the sands in March, the resort's residents are struggling to put the violence behind them. In Grand Bassam, swimsuits have replaced the police cordons, but visitors are yet to return. On the beach, there are more sellers than tourists. A month after the attacks, Grand Bassam is a different town. Nothing is working. No one's coming to the beach. It's very difficult. On a Saturday or a Sunday, I could earn between five and 10,000 francs. Yesterday, I only made 500. L'Etoile de Sud, one of the hotels hit in the attacks, wanted to reopen immediately. But here, like all the restaurants along the seaside, tables are almost empty. The occupancy rate has dropped from 80 to 3%. When you come to L'Etoile du Sud, you normally have to fight for the sun loungers. All of them are usually taken. People come early to get the best places, the best sunbeds. But now there's no one. It shows there's still fear out there. People are a little hesitant, but we have hope. We will carry on as normal and hope that they will come. The Ivorian government has promised 200 million francs CEFA to help Bassam. Security has been strengthened. Police officers patrol the streets. And the few customers who still come want to help the town recover. There's no reason not to come. Everything's safe. For me, I think there's no problem. I think that by not coming, people are supporting the terrorists because that's what they want, to scare people off. Nobody here can forget. But a month after the attacks, hotel owners, residents and artists are all determined to recover. Malawi and Mozambique have raised the alarm of a food shortages linked to persistent drought in southern Africa. The dry weather has also caused water levels at Lake Kariba, one of Africa's biggest dams, to drop to a record low. As well as impacting the livelihoods of communities relying on its supply, the shortage is also threatening the already insecure power supplies of Zambia and Zimbabwe. As the water levels drop lower and lower, bathtub rings form around the Kariba Dam. Two years into an El Nino-induced drought that has wreaked havoc across southern Africa, the dam is now close to empty. Now at the lake itself, we've got the two stations, the generating stations in Zambia and Zimbabwe. They are between the two of them on a daily basis. They are um, consuming between 900 and 1,000 cubic meters. This time last year, the lake was 51% full. Now at 12%, it's a record low. This means that not enough hydropower is being generated for Zambia and Zimbabwe, two countries who are both heavily reliant on it. Kariba Dam's current water resource for power generation is said to last just five months longer. But the Zimbezi River Authority has ruled out any shutdown of the power generators, choosing instead countermeasures such as power imports and the adoption of alternative energy resources. Local fishermen like Wanda Dipuka are also feeling the effects of the subsiding waters. Now his catch has been reduced to a quarter of the amount he used to get and only allows him to pay for the basics. We did not get good rains this year. 
and the water level in the lake is very low. We are not catching as much fish as we used to in 2014 and the years gone by. It's now very difficult to survive because there are no jobs in Kariba. As the drought continues, more locals who count on it for survival are at risk, while Zambia and Zimbabwe face yet more enforced blackouts. Godfrey Mwampembwa, pen name Gado, has long been Kenya's most famous cartoonist. After 20 few years of poking fun at the political elite with his sketches, the nation newspaper with which he's long worked says his services are no longer required. He believes the move's proof of a state crackdown on press freedoms. This comes amidst a series of alleged moves to silence critical journalists. Duncan Woodside reports. Gado is something of an institution here in Kenya. His sketches in the privately owned nation newspaper, a feature of daily life for nearly a quarter of a century. A chance for Kenyans to laugh at their political masters. This is January last year, which I compared the pres president of Uhuru to the emperor without cloth. But after a short sabbatical, his contract with the paper hasn't been renewed. He claims the decision is due to pressure from State House. There's no question that the pressure has gotten, uh, the pressure got its way. We have seen um, an administration that is trying to roll back the, uh, the gains that um, Kenya has made. He's just one of several people so far this year, including a senior editor who wrote an opinion piece criticizing President Uhuru Kenyatta's performance, who've fallen foul of the paper's management. The newspaper insists the departures are totally unrelated to alleged pressure from the authorities. The question of departures of people from, from the nation is uh, purely um, a HR issue. Uh, contracts uh, ended uh, in, in some cases, uh, and in some cases uh, assignments uh, were, were restructured. State House claims it exerts no pressure whatsoever on private media in Kenya. Uh, the, the allegations are uh, absolute rubbish. Uh, we live in a country in which freedom of expression is not in dispute. We probably have the freest media on the African continent. Gado isn't going hungry. He's getting other offers of work, including from an international news agency. A new creation, a sketch of Uganda's freshly re-elected President Yari Museveni having nightmares that he'll end up meeting the same miserable fate as Libya's Colonel Gaddafi. A group of Kenyan photographers are inviting people to look at their country with fresh eyes. They've travelled across the land, capturing images of places forgotten, ignored and breathtaking, and exhibited the fruits of their labour in the capital. One Touch is the name of a group of Kenyan photographers. They went to both urban and rural areas seeking to show their country in a new light. One Touch organized an exhibition in Nairobi called Beyond. We are sick and tired of seeing stereotypical photos of Africans. We want to show people going about their lives in a triumphant way. You know, you're not, you, we see people in, yes, in some difficult circumstances, but it's not my head down waiting to die or waiting for someone to come and help me. The organizers of the exhibition said they had a specific objective in mind. We're trying to get to external audiences to maybe change their view or their idea of what they think Africa is or Kenya, but also to internal audiences and telling people there's more to your country, uh, there's more to your region than what you think or that what you uh, were raised to believe. Photography enthusiasts enjoyed the pictures of beautiful landscapes, but also those with a grittier side. These are things that we should explore in our films. These are things that we should showcase to the world. And I'm liking that Beyond is, is an opportunity for the world and for Kenyans to just view ourselves in perspectives that we rarely do. All the photographs are also on sale for $100 each. Part of the proceeds are going to the hunger-free organization. A head teacher in the South African province of Umtata is suing the government because he says that his school is not getting enough support. With almost 2,000 students trying to get an education, the institution's operating out of only a few classrooms. Our correspondents report. 
This is one of the most overcrowded schools in South Africa. There are 198 learners in this grade 10 class. There's no space for desks. Everybody must work on their laps. Teachers don't even have enough textbooks for their pupils. So it's not easy for us. No individual attention. For instance, I was doing the, the classwork here. I, I, I'm not quite sure that everybody did do the homework. We are 10 kilometers from Tata in the homeland of Nelson Mandela. The school has more than 1,800 children and numbers are growing every year. No class has less than 80 pupils. The principal has been fighting for 10 years to get better infrastructure here. He also has 24 vacant teaching posts, but his pleas have been falling on deaf ears. Tired of waiting, the school board has decided to sue the Ministry of Education, saying it failed in its duties. If the department cannot provide the service that they are charged to, to, to render, then the only way, the only recourse that one can take is to take the department to a place where they will be forced to render the service. The school's threat has been effective. A few weeks after filing court papers, bulldozers arrive to prepare for renovations. The temporary structures will be ready next month, but the principal won't drop his legal action. He is continuing his fight for better infrastructure. I will put on more fight. In fact, in 1955, the people of this country met in Clip Town and they said doors of learning shall be open. Which doors are we going to open if there are no schools? Vuyani Langa won the award for best leadership last year. Against all odds, his school has still managed a 100% pass rate. Well, that's it for Across Africa. But remember, you can always catch up on news from across the continent with our daily Eye on Africa show, Monday to Friday. But join us again for Across Africa next time if you can. Take care.